life for having me. I, I love being here with y'all. I really mean it. I don't, I'm not just saying it because I'm here. I really, I love being able to be with people who, who feel like family. And I've been coming here for a long time. And y'all feel like family, y'all worship so hard, and you look like a big bag of Skittles. All the colors of the rainbow are here, so that's fun. <laughs> Uh, I was telling the last service, I, I forgot to say this in the first two, but how, how I was introduced to Anthony was probably, it's got to be 16 or 17 years ago. I, I, I followed his father. I, I, I got pretty much every tape. It was cassette tape, remember back in the day? And um, uh, I would listen to him all the time. And, and so when the internet kind of came on, I remember, remember the whole dial-up? So I'd watch the service online, and then it was one Sunday you actually came and sang at your father's church and you, you did a song during the offering. Right after that, I contacted somebody in the bookstore and I said, hey, can I get his phone number if he's ever out in Southern California? Because at the time, you lived in Dallas. And um, so you came out, it was, what, 15, 16 years ago, before, before he was... Doing Anthony all this other. recording and yeah, stuff. And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Before The Voice. Yeah, it was way, it was way before The Voice. In fact, <laughs> after The Voice, uh, you were on The Voice and then... You got robbed, but anyhow, <laughs> you should have, but we went to, I took him out to Wood Ranch and it was just funny. You could see everybody in the restaurant, they're like, <laughs> and, uh, so anyhow, um, but how, how, where God's taken the last 15 years is amazing. And I just want, I want to talk about this because we all know he's a gifted musician, gifted vocalist, gifted worship leader, true, come on. And, but he also just wrote a book, and the, the book's actually not out, and I haven't told you this, but they brought, I think, 350 books with them, and we're, we're down to less than 50 books left, so they're going to be fighting out in the lobby. But uh, So worship leader, credible, gifted uh, uh, artist, but he also wrote a book, and I know it, that had to be a little intimidating because your dad's an author, your sister's an author, actually both sisters are authors, so yeah. what was the impetus to, to writing the book? Um, that, it was very intimidating because my... my Sister's books do really well, both of them, and my dad is my dad, so I was like, oh man, I don't want to, let me just sing, let them do all this stuff, but, <laughs> but I got asked by the, the publisher, by Thomas Nelson, to write my story. They were like, basically, we know the tip of the iceberg of Anthony, we know the worship leader, we know the singer, but there will be a lot of people who will connect with what's gone on in your life underneath the surface of you. Like, we want to know what has led you to standing there in, in the center of the stage, and, and I was. I agreed to write it. Uh, very nervous to to write it, and I, I agreed on one, on a one condition, and that and that is I, I could write short chapters because I have like ADD. So when I, I literally while I'm up here singing, my mind's like squirrel, squirrel. Like I have to really focus in. So they're little like micro chapters, so that somebody like me can like sit down for five minutes, get the point, walk away. You know what I mean? So that that's what we did there. Yeah. So uh, 34 chapters in the small book. So it's and I've read. I love he's laughing at it in my face. Like <laughs> I can hear you. I'm right here. <laughs> uh, so actually, I read probably the first seven in five minutes, but um. <laughs> For service, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> exactly, we got time. <laughs> no, he, uh, it's, it's actually really, really, really good. And uh, so talk to us about the book and what was the impetus behind it. Well, it's called Unexpected Places and Thoughts on God, Faith, and Finding Your Voice. I, um, you know, I, I mentioned underneath the surface of all of us in this room, if we could pass a mic around, we all have a story underneath the surface of what people see um, that has led us to who we are today. Um, and I believe that God is a lot of times waiting on us to be authentic, vulnerable, and transparent with each other and him so that we can start with the real, start with the, start with re the reality of who we are and what we're facing. Mm. And for a long time, being an Evans and being a preacher's kid and a worship leader, I would put on a pretense. I would smile, shake hands, kiss babies, make everybody think everything was good when I wasn't good. I was dealing with depression at some times in this book where I was standing on stage singing about the faithfulness of God and not believing a word that was coming out of my mouth. And it was excuse me, I had to make a decision to go into the, the place, choose courage over comfort and go into the place of whether it's counseling or dealing with me on a raw level. And it was in those unexpected places. That's one of an instance of one of the unexpected places where God 
met me and has turned that into something very, very beautiful that, that he could use. And I don't ever want people to misconceive standing up here and trying to be in jeans that are too tight and singing worship songs. You know, I don't want people to misconceive that with I've got it all together um, at all. Uh, we are all a work in progress and it's it, literally God is waiting for you to just take that step of faith, choose that over fear, and he will work and do something magnificent with what you give him. Awesome. There are uh, so many awesome things in the book, but if, if somebody were to buy it after the service, what's, what's like the, the one thing you would say, hey, if they read this, I hope they would walk away with fill in the blank? Um, well, there's, there's a couple things, but, but one thing that, that kind of was the reason why this all happened was me choosing to obey. Um, I, I, I guess being my dad's son, everything is pictures to us. Everything is illustrations. That's how he talks. But I was on a plane a couple years ago. And it was right when, I don't know, everything started going wrong with airlines and the, the flight attendants were mad. Everybody was just angry. And so I was, I was kind of, well, it's not their fault. I was about to say I was responding to them. But no, I made a choice to kind of not be a jerk one day. And, and uh, they were telling me to buckle my seatbelt, put my computer away because it's time for takeoff. And I was annoyed because I needed to finish an email. So I was not closing my computer because I just had one more to go. And I know, like, my computer's not attached to the engines of the plane. Like, y'all be, be fine. You know what I mean? Just let me finish this email. So she told me, like, three or four times. And by the fourth time, she squatted down in my face like a kindergarten teacher would do to a student and said, sir, you need to put on your seatbelt and close your computer. And I, and I was just kind of like, ma'am, I need you to stand back straight. And <laughs> I'm a worship leader, but I'm also a little bit mentally unstable. So I need you to stand up. And, uh, but no, when I got beyond that, she said, you have asked us to take you to a destination and we cannot do that. We cannot take you where you're asking us to take you until you put on your seatbelt and close that computer. And I thought about how many times in my life, in my walk with the Lord, I have prayed and begged for him to take me from point A to point B. And he is telling me to do some things that are seemingly insignificant in my life. You know, whatever those, whatever those little things are that God's asking you to obey in, whether it's like, nope, get rid of that relationship or do, and I'm kind of like, no, take me to my destination and I'm gonna do it my way. And he is saying to me, until you do that, I cannot take you to where you've asked us to, you've asked me to take you. So um, uh, some of the acts of being uh, obedient, um, one of them led to this, this book happening. And so my, my encouragement is this is because I took one or two steps of obedience that seemed inconsequential and insignificant. And then God was able to take me to where um, I had been asking to go all along anyway. So that's my encouragement to, to, to you guys. Uh, last question. I didn't ask this in any of the services, but uh, I know you're still single and uh, it's probably a lot of applications that, uh, no, how, I, I'm just thinking you're like, how have you remained faithful to the Lord? It's a two-part question. How have you as a single guy been faithful to the Lord? And then B, because uh, I don't know if people know your family like I do, at least from a distance. I, uh, I mean, you're your sister is an actor, incredible preacher, author. Your family is incredibly dynamic, gifted, anointed. And so first question is just as a single guy, how, how have you just really got, gone after God? And then second, as a family, what did you guys do as a family to all of your kids are on fire, all being used powerfully by the Lord? So those two things. Well, the single guy question I'll answer because um, I have to. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> You know, I have a, there's a chapter in the book that talks about a time I went through where broken engagement and some other issues. And I, um, I don't do well to what people expect from me. And, and growing up in church, when everybody was like, who are you going to marry? Who are you going to be with? It created a resentment in me for people wanting, like saying that I have to do that. And so I actually pushed the other, like to the whole other direction where I kind of shut that down, especially after the broken engagement stuff. I was like, nope, I'm good. And, um, Remaining faithful is hard, but I have a family that's all in my business. Priscilla is like, <laughs> my dad, Priscilla especially, she's just all in my business. How are you doing? What's going on? Who are you talking to? What's, you know, so having, having all that um, accountability has, has been um, great for me. And then I also just have issues I'm working on and getting over. It took me a long time to start doing the counseling and doing the work and, you know, I click for me, reading Bible verses and just praying wasn't enough to deal with the issues that were really going on inside of me. And there was, there's resentment that I had toward church because I felt like there's four kids in our family. I felt like the church was the fifth child with special needs and it was getting all the attention. So my parents weren't doing that intentionally, but when you have people after you like that, I kind of started to push away. So it took a while for me to 
not consider church to be the one who took, who took my parents away, mm. you know? Um, and I talk about that. And I, uh, so I'm working through it. I know at this point, um, when I get married and have kids, I'll be like, Grandpa, Dad, you know, like, go to pick up your kids from kindergarten. They're like, your grandpa's here to get you. But I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so, and then when it comes to my family, my dad and my mom were really faithful at the house. You know, when you're dealing with a kid like me um, who had all this resentment, they didn't even know about it because I was really good. I was like, third child, peacemaker. I make, don't, don't, make, don't ruffle even any feathers. They didn't know I had that. But they were never different from the church to home. And when I was a kid in the formidable years, my dad was doing promise keepers. Do y'all remember, remember yeah. hearing about that growing up? I mean, and it was huge. I would fly out with my dad on the weekends to go to these stadiums of like 70,000 dudes and they were just like, yeah, you know, it was like 300, you know what I mean? Um, do y'all know that movie? Okay, I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah. It, it was like that. It's like warriors in a, in a stadium and they would all yell when, when my dad was preaching and they would yell and, and there'd be this eruption. And in my mind, I would be thinking, I can never be him. That's what I thought. And my dad would come home after those events and make sure that he was still investing in our hearts and our lives. Um, and that's how I feel like all of us in individual ways now have seen the faithfulness of God. It hasn't been because of stadiums and books and radio. It's been because they came home and were the same people at home that that's they awesome. were on the stage. Wow. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Really good. Um, so the last thing on, on behalf of our church, thank, no more services, so we, you'll get to go after this. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> no, but we thank God for your friendship and faithfulness. You and your entire family are such a blessing to our church, but more importantly to the body of Christ. We don't see a lot of pastors and families finishing well, and you have, uh, your family's been a model to us from a distance, uh, what it means to really love God and, and continue to finish strong. So... Thank you for your friendship in, in our church for the last 15 years, and, and, and I follow you. You're, you're in big places and big stadiums, and the fact that you would still be open to coming to our church on an annual basis means a lot to me and our church, and so we thank God for your service and sacrifice, and I love you with all my heart. I just got to say, you, you mentioned, sorry, you said last service. It's a, yeah. I, you said coming to your church or, come, you know, doing the big events and, and coming here. I consider you guys to be the big event because I don't, um, I know I had to redefine what success is. I'm, I'm, I'll be done in 20 seconds, I promise. And I go after peace now, not the thing that's the biggest or the flashiest. And that, because you cannot, after accomplishing what we believe is success, you cannot then go write a check for peace. You can't go purchase peace after you've been successful the way we, we define it. So I love to be at places like this where I feel at peace and that's success to me and that's the big thing. So thank you for allowing me to be here with you because I consider that to be the the thing, you know? So thank you for that. Uh, the last thing I want to say, just because this is the last service. <laughs> That's happened four no, times. No. <laughs> <laughs> lastly, lastly. Yeah. No, I just have, I really have a word, I think, from the Lord for you. Um, that I think people have seen you as a worship leader and an artist, but you have more inside of you. And this is, this is the beginning of what, what the more is, I think. I think it's not just singing and, and leading worship. I think it's also speaking. So don't, don't say no to that and just be open to what the Holy Spirit has for you. And I, I believe God's opening doors and uh, tent stakes are going to be expanded in ways that you've never dreamt. I, I know this was like a, what? You want me to do what? And I think there's more things coming down the pike. And so just, just receive what the Lord has for you. And again, once again, we thank, we thank God for you and your influence. And I'm proud to call you my friend. Thank I love you, man. You. Thanks. All right, grab your Bible there. Would you turn to the book of uh, 2 Samuel? We're continuing our series. This is going to be a little shorter than my usual. Usually I'll preach 45 minutes or so. We're just going to go like 43. <laughs> and I am actually losing my voice here, so we'll kind of fight through it. But uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 is going to be our text today. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And just to en encourage me, how many of you brought your Bible to church today? And let's, let's just go ahead and uh, hold up our Bible in the air. Our phone's great, Kevin. Awesome iPads, phones, Bibles, and, and keep it up in the air really high. And I want everybody to look around. This is awesome. I, I love this, that we bring our Bible to church. Amen? How many are excited about the Bible? Yeah. Amen. So pull it out, Second Samuel chapter 11. We're in a series. I believe this is week number five in our series on the life of David. How many have been enjoying the series so far? Good. That's awesome. Thank you, 13 of you that raised your hand. And we paid half of you to say that. It's okay to make some noise in church. How many have been blessed by the series so far? 
Amen. Amen. Second Samuel chapter 11, we're just going to look at five verses. Um, by the way, uh, my son is, gives his greetings from South Carolina and is loving hanging out with Travis Green. In fact, uh, Travis, uh, they combined all three services into one. They had a service out in the park, and he texted us and said that Travis let him do the announcements today. So that was cool. So, yeah, he'll be going to a bunch of places with uh, John Gray and Tasha Cobbs and all these people. It's like, must be tough. <clears throat> but anyhow, he's having a great time but missing home, and, uh, and I miss him, but uh, it's only going to be for a season. So he sends greetings. Second Samuel chapter 11. You got it? Okay, so hold your place there and then look this way. Uh, I've been telling the services today, because uh, if you're new to the church, you wouldn't know this, but my, my dad was like really intense. Uh, how many have ever heard me talk about a little bit about my dad? And the crazy thing is uh, my dad was so strict and he was in the army for a couple of years and he was just really, really intense. And we, we honestly, we got, we didn't get spanked, we got beat. How many got beat, man? It's just like, jack you up. And uh, I was like, oh! And many paddles were broken and brushes. And the worst, when he would say, hey, go out and pick out a reed from the tree and bring it back. I'm like, what? Hey, make sure you pick a really thick one. And uh, so my dad was really, really intense. And my dad, um, we, like when he said at the count of three, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count to three. And when I get to three, you better, then you better. And he wasn't like, okay, when I count to three, one. You hear what I'm saying? Two, two and a quarter, two and a half, two and three fourths, two and seven eighths, two and whatever. He, he didn't do that. It was just like, one, two, bam. And uh, so because we lived in Westlake Village, the climate there's a little hotter than it is here. We had a swimming pool, two-story house in Westlake Village. And so uh, one time, uh, just friends and I, we decided it'd be really cool because we had a swimming pool below to get up on the roof of our second story and jump into the swimming pool below. And I kind of thought my dad probably wouldn't be too into it, but uh, we, because he was working in LA, we took a chance and we were jumping off the roof. It was a lot of fun. And uh, my dad found out about it because his mom uh, came out from Ohio for a week or so and she told uh, on us, she said, Stevie, and he called me Stevie, and Gary, and all the, they were, they brought their friends, and they were all jumping off the roof, and my dad came home, and he said, if you ever jump off the roof, and uh, so anyhow, probably a year went by, so next summer, and I remember my dad leaving one morning, and he said, hey, I'm going to, to work, and he worked in LA, and back then, there wasn't a lot of traffic, but there were some, and he says, uh, I'll be back, and he usually get, got back at 5.30 or 6 or 6.30, depending on the traffic, and so it was like, I, I remember it was like one afternoon, it was probably 90 degrees this August, and uh, it was just too hot not to go swimming and too fun not to jump back on the roof. And so all my friends came over and my brothers and sisters brought their friends. There was probably 15 or 20 of us and we're all the, by, all the way, young people just look at me, this is, um, do not do this at home, okay? It was very, very dangerous. And the reason why it was dangerous is because when you got on the second story, you, you didn't just jump down into the pool because if you jumped straight down, you'd hit the concrete, you had to jump out. So you had to get back here and you get a running start and then you would jump out and hopefully you'd miss the concrete and we did and we got into the swimming pool and so I don't know what happened because he said he was coming home later that night but I just I, I can still hear the back screen door like the hinges just exploded off of the the back and it, my, my dad went out there and I don't even know like I'm up on the roof and like all my friends are gone I'm like because I, I heard Steve and then and all my friends they're like they over the wall, and then I'm like, hey, what happened? I'm up here by myself. My dad goes outside, and he looks up, and he said, get off of the road, and he just screamed as loud as he could, and I can, I can even hear, like today, even though he passed away like six years ago, I can still hear him say, get off of the roof. In fact, why don't you say it out loud? Yeah, and it was, but it was way more intense than that. And then, and then here's what he said, af, like, what happened after? Well, I got down out, of, out, and he said, go up into your room. I'll be up there in like 10 minutes. How many ever got that, too? I, I would rather just like, can you please beat me right now? <laughs> Those are the longest tent. You get up in your room, you're just like, hurry, get in here. And you're just thinking about how bad it's going to hurt. And you're putting like magazines in your bottom and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and I don't have time to get into that. But I can still remember even today as I was thinking about the story, I still remember here, this is like 30 years. No, this is 40 years ago. Get off the roof. Because it was dangerous up there. That's the title of my message. Let's all say it. Ready? Get off the roof, get off there. And you're going to find out why in a second, 2 Samuel chapter 11. But let me say this. I have been so privileged. My wife and I were youth pastors. Before we started the church, we were youth pastors for eight years. And if you could preach to junior hires, you can preach to anybody. 
And everybody said amen. amen. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor Andrew? You guys did. And, uh, and so we, uh, we were youth pastors for eight years, and I, I saw a lot of kids in our youth group come to life in Christ. I, I, I spoke at camps, and I saw a lot of kids come forward, tears in their eyes. And, and then in 21 years as a senior pastor, we, I, I've personally led thousands of people to life in Christ either raising their hand at the end of the service, coming forward, going to the prayer room. Just at our Easter services alone, we'll have over 100, sometimes 200 people making decisions for Christ. And let me remind us, by the way, this is why we're here. This is why we do what we do. It's not about what just takes place in the four walls. That's awesome. But uh, our, our goal in God saving us was not just to go to heaven. Amen. Otherwise, when he saved you, he would have just said, okay, you're going to heaven, boom, and he shot you right in the head and you go to heaven, right? Right? No, he left us here with an assignment, with a message to, to share the good news with other people that don't know him. But I've had the privilege, like literally thousands of people coming forward and tears in their eyes and making commitments and lives are being changed. And, and I, I'm excited about every person that comes to know Christ. But now that I've been doing this almost 30 years, I don't get as excited about people that make commitments because it's easy to raise your hand in the service. It's easy to even easy to come forward or go into a prayer room and pray for That's the easy part. It's easy to start something. It's harder to finish. Can I get some amens in the house? Isn't that true? It's true in the natural, isn't it? Isn't it true to go to a gym and just like 30 bucks, I'm going to sign up for Gold's Gym or LA Fitness? That's the easy part. The hard part is to work out. It's to wake up early and get on the treadmill, work on the elliptical, lift some weights. It's easy to get married. Isn't it easy, right? Stand up in front of your friends and family. It's easy to vows and rings and the honeymoon's awesome. Everybody, I've never met anybody that had a horrible time on their honeymoon. It's awesome. But I want to know when you get back from the honeymoon, will you still have an awesome marriage a year from now, five years from now? I've been married 20, 29, 39, 50 years. That's the hard part. It's easy to get married. It's harder to stay married. It's easy to go on a diet. You know what I'm talking about? You could wake up tomorrow and say, I got to lose some weight. And you can be very diligent and, and uh, did for like 24 hours. You're doing great on Tuesday. You come to church on Wednesday. You're like, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Go to church on Wednesday. And somebody says, hey, let's go to In-N-Out. You're like, no, I can't. Come on, we're all going. Okay, I'll go. And then you go two, two cheeseburgers and, you know, those French fries with onions and all that stuff on. And it's easy to start a diet. It's harder to maintain the diet. Can you make some noise in here, right? And so I'm less impressed the older I get and the longer I've been around about people that start a relationship with Christ. I'm excited about it. I'm thankful for it. But I want to know in a year from now, five years from now, when you go through hell, when, when you go through some difficult things, when there's some challenges and setbacks and obstacles, will you still finish Strong. The Bible says, he who endures to the end will be saved. And so I'm more impressed about people that finish well. And how many know, as we've been studying the life of David, he's been awesome. First Samuel 16, God plucks him out of the sheep pen and said, you are the next king of Israel. And God placed his finger upon him and says, you're anointed, you're called, you're appointed by me. And uh, so he doesn't get to experience the, the, the position for, for many years. But nonetheless, in 1 Samuel 16, God puts a calling upon his life. In 1 Samuel 17, he takes down a giant. Most theologians believe the giant was over nine feet tall. He's just a little boy with a couple stones and a slingshot. By the way, here's a whole nother message. God can use what you have in your hand. And then 1 Samuel 18 through 23, we talked about that. Then he's been running from his life because Saul, who is the present king, is jealous of him and has been chasing him. And if you were here last week, we talked about don't cut corners, that, that David had his opportunity to take out Saul and he cut a corner of his robe. And we talked about not cutting corners and honoring people. And, and everything's been going great. The kingdom has been established. David is now on the throne. And everything falls apart here in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Why? Because it's not how you start, it's how you finish. In fact, that before I read uh, the text, I want you to look at this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, and therefore, let anyone, let me just ask, do we have any anyone's in the room? Okay, good. Raise your hand if you're an anyone. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. I want you to see two words here. Number one is the first word, stands. Everyone say stands. How many, I want to ask you, how many of you want to take a stand for Jesus? Like every day of your life, I'm going to take a stand for God. He took a stand for me 2,000 years ago. I'm going to take a stand for him. And having done all to stand is what the Bible says. Stand firm in your faith. That's what I want to do every day of my life. I'm not perfect, you know that. But I want to, every time I wake up, I want to take a stand for Jesus Christ in the middle of this culture. Someone say stand. But notice the last word in the, in the verse, stand, and then the word is 
fall. And I want you to see what is coupled between the words stand and fall. The Bible says, take heed. Uh, NIV, I believe it says, be careful. If you are here today thinking to yourself, man, if David, we're going to discover in the chapter of David, a man after God's own heart. God said that about David. Can you imagine that? If God said that, he's a man after my own heart. If David the king of Israel, a man after God's own heart, a brave warrior, a, courage, a courageous leader, a poet, a guy that wrote a bunch of the Psalms. If that guy can fall, then anybody should, can fall. And you should be like going ding, 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 ding. Yeah, even if the guy that the Bible said was a man after God's own heart, if he can fall, check it out, anybody in the room can fall. In fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you could fall, you could fall for sure, right? And so the Bible says, between standing and falling, be careful, take heed, lest you and I fall. Now we're gonna see in the text here that uh, David takes a major fall, and I want you to write down three things. Point number one is this. First of all, we're gonna see in verse one, David's choice. Write that down in your notes. So number one, David's, his what? Choice. David's choice. David's choice. Beginning at verse one, the Bible says, in the spring, because they didn't, they didn't fight during the winter time, so now it's the spring. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David was a king. So usually at springtime, the kings are like, okay guys, let's go, it's time to go out and fight the battle. So in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David, you should be out on the battlefield too. But David sent Joab out with the king's men Everybody should go, what? Let me read it again. But David sent Joab out with the king's men. Exactly. What, what, why aren't you out there, David? And here's the reason, because David made a choice to stay back in the palace. He made a choice, a choice, a choice. The majority of the problems in my life, the majority, not all of them, but the majority are because, look at me, bad choices I have made. I wish I could blame it on my parents. Because that's what the culture says. That's what uh, psychologists say. Hey, it's somebody else's fault. And this has gone all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Isn't it true? Adam, he got busted. He blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. The serpent doesn't have any fingers to point, so he's busted. But this is all over the place. So I don't know why David didn't go out in battle. Maybe he woke up this day. In fact, the Bible says in the afternoon he woke up from a nap thinking to myself, hey, his soldiers didn't have the privilege of staying back in the palace. But for whatever reason, David made a choice to stay in the palace and not go out to battle. He wasn't forced. He wasn't coerced. He wasn't compelled. He wasn't pushed. He wasn't pulled. Nobody made him do it. It was a choice that he made. It was a choice. And most of the times we have problems in our life is because of poor choices that we have made. Listen, we live in a culture that says it's your parents' fault. They never went to your little league games. They didn't go to your dance recital. Okay, but you know your dad's dad didn't even know that your dad was on a little league team? And, and it's easy to blame other people. My parents were there, so they weren't this. And I'm not saying that some of the choices your parents made or your boss made or your ex made doesn't impact your life. But listen, I can rise above that and overcome that, and I can make a choice today. I'm not going to be bound by the choices other people have made or not made in my life. So David made a choice. I don't know. He woke up and said, you know what? I'm tired of fighting battles. Somebody else's turn. I've been fighting enemies my whole life. I'm gonna, I deserve a little R&R. &R. And he made a really bad choice, choice. And the culture says, I'll blame somebody else, it's their fault. So right now, this is going on in 2018, ready? There are eight inmates in Idaho right now suing different breweries. They're suing Coors, Budweiser, Heineken, you fill in the blank. Because they be, all became alcoholics and they did stupid things and they made decisions and they got, they're in jail for a long time and now they're suing eight different breweries across the United States saying, hey, the reason why I'm in jail, the reason why I did stupid things is because you didn't warn me about the side effects of alcohol. I know, isn't that crazy? And there's a, a father in New Jersey, his kid, his kid's a high school senior, just got kicked off of the track team. Question, why? because he had a multiple, many, multiple unexcused absences. He didn't show up to practice. Hey, how come he didn't come? I didn't feel like it. Well, you need to show up tomorrow. Didn't show up again. Multiple unexcused absences. So the, the coach said, hey, you ain't coming to practice? You're out of here. So the dad's suing the school and the coach for, get this, $40 million, saying that his son is being robbed of college scholarships. 
I'm like, dude, get to practice, you loser. It's not your coach's fault. It's, whose fault is it? And then, have you, have you been following the, the 30-year-old guy in New York? He's like, he was trying to sue his parents because his parents were like, hey, you need to get a job and stop playing video games. Get out of the house. You're 30. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. Get out. And they had to get a lawyer and stuff because the guy wouldn't leave. He's just in the basement playing video games. Dude, get a job. You are 30. And he, there's a lawsuit, and well, it's my parents, and they're making me leave. What are you, dude, you're not 13. You're 30 years old, okay? But this is all around us in a culture, and David, for whatever reason, made a choice. I'm not going out to the battlefield. I'm staying in bed, and we're going to discover that his, his choice has a major consequence. We'll talk about that. The end of verse 1 says, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. In other words, everything is going really good in the life of David. He's now on the throne. He's got all these servants at his disposal. He's got power. He's got influence. He's got impact. The kingdom has been united. Saul has been defeated. David is now on the throne. Things are going really well. Here's what I've discovered about my life. There's a lot more pressure now for me, now that our church is, quote, successful. 4,000 people, four services. God's given us more influence. It's, there, there's way more things I have to be cautious of because it's in the high times, it's in the good times. Because when we were 40 people in a hotel, there wasn't as much pressure back then. But you got to be really careful because here's what I've discovered. The longer that you're serving the Lord, if you don't make wise choices, those choices are going to take you down. David's at a point in his life where he's saying, hey, man I, man, I got it, man. I got servants. I got influence. I got power. I've got prestige. I got possessions. I got people to do whatever. I just got to snap my fingers and boom, it's going to happen. And for whatever reason, we're not really sure, but he made a choice to stay at the palace instead of going out of the battlefield. He made a choice to stay in bed instead of fighting with the soldiers. The choice. Check this out, Luke chapter 22, verse 54, coming on the screen. So they arrested him and led him to the high priest, arrested Jesus, and Peter followed at what? Think about this. Jesus is about to get crucified, and one of his best friends, because we know his three best friends are who? Peter, James, and and one of his best friends, Peter, the Bible says in Luke twenty two fifty four, 54, is following him at a distance. Check this out. Listen carefully. It's possible to come to church every Sunday morning and follow Jesus at a distance. You know the lady with the issue of blood? The Bible says that there was a crowd around Jesus. All these people are, but there's only one person touching him. Listen, listen. It's possible to be in a crowd every Sunday and not be touching him. Peter was following at a distance. And when you follow Jesus at a distance, you stop hearing his voice. I'm reminded, uh, we went on a missions trip with a, when I was a high school youth pastor. We went, took about 100 junior high and high school kids to Mexico. And we got in there like on a Sunday night or Monday, and we were going to build homes and do some outreaches with kids and stuff. And, but before we started, the night before, the guy that was leading the team said, hey, we're going to do some team building exercises because you want to make sure when you're on a mission trip, you got the right people and you got unity and stuff. And so they did these really cool exercises called team building. And I remember one of them, uh, he kind of set up this obstacle course. It was probably like 100 uh, yards long or something. And he, he purposely uh, picked the obstacle course where there's some trees and stuff and puddles of water. And so here was the, 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 the goal was this. One kid... Uh, was blindfolded and it was dark. It was the sun had already set, so it was dark. He was blindfolded. He couldn't see anything. Then the other kid, his job was to tell the kid that was blindfolded how to get to the end, a hundred yards down. But there was there was branches in the way and trees and puddles. And so for whatever I don't know why I remember this, but I remember two of the cues were this. One was when you hear low bridge, low bridge. There was going to be like a branch or something. And so. One kid would say, low bridge, so the kid would duck down and miss it, so not get hit in the face, right? Then the other one was, puddle, watch out for the puddle. So low bridge, puddle, so the kid would take off, and he's got to navigate this course, right? Low bridge, over, so the kid squats down, and then, watch out for the puddle. He'd move out of the way for the puddle. Go, go left, 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 left. low bridge, low bridge, watch out for the puddle. But it was interesting, the, when he started, like, when he got about 30 or 40 yards out, what sounded like, low bridge, low bridge, it got muffled. You know what I'm saying? So I went from low bridge, low bridge to 
crazy stuff like low blow, blow pop. It was just, I don't know what happened. But the kid would get out. He did pretty good for 40 or 50 yards. But by, by the end, in fact, all the kids would come back and they got hit in the head with a branch and their blood over here and scars on their face. And, and instead, instead of watch out for the puddle, it probably sounded like don't step on the poodle or ramen noodles or something like that. And uh, so it, it, was, it was interesting though, but it taught me a lesson. The further you get away from the voice, the more trouble you're gonna get in. And that, that, that's our Christian life. The further we get away from the voice of the Holy Spirit, the more trouble that we're gonna get in. Do you know what the Bible says that if we stop listening to his voice, here's what happens, our own conscience gets seared. So the things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. The movies that you would never watch or now watching or shows that you, I would never watch it. Now you're watching today the things that you said you would never say, now you're saying, and you, you stop listening to that internal voice of the Holy Spirit, your own conscience gets seared. So David made a choice. What did that lead to? Second thing, write it down. Number two, it led to compromise. David's compromise, and that's found in verses two through four. Someone say compromise. compromise. Bible says in verse two, one evening David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was what? She was, she was what? You know the Bible's not prone to flattery too, by the way, so when it says she was a knockout, she was a knockout. When it says that she was a Baywatch babe, she was a Baywatch babe. And check it out, so David, he, he's, he, come, he wakes up from a nap, I'm just picturing it, I'm a vi visual guy, he wakes up from his nap, everybody else is out in the battle. He picks up his binoculars, he's walking out on the roof, and he's, and he probably hears like splashing of water. Now, I told the last service this. I, I really believe that 99% of the responsibility falls on David because he, he wasn't where he should have been. But I think probably 1%, maybe 2% has got to be on Bathsheba. There's no way that she didn't know that the king lived there. There's no way that she didn't know that he was probably up on the roof. And I don't know, she was probably wearing some provocative bathing suit of some kind. And again, most of the responsibility is on David. But it's just a reminder to the ladies in the church. The Bible says to dress with modesty because men are very visual. And if you're wearing something that's very revealing, the first thing that men are drawn to is, so you got to be really careful. But again, 99% of the responsibility is on David. So he gets the binoculars, he checks her out, and the Bible says she was very beautiful. Check out the warning in verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, and David sent someone to find out about her. So you got to know the alarm's going off in his soul. And David sent someone to find out. D David, stop, stop, stop. What are you doing? Don't do it. Don't do it. God's speaking to you. Don't. How many know he does the same thing to us? Don't do it. Don't go on Facebook. Don't try to get on that fling with somebody that you had a first love. You're, you're married. Don't do it. Don't say that. Don't post that. Delete that email. Do not send that. Don't go to that movie. Don't give people a piece of your mind. They don't care about your opinion. Don't, don't, don't. And woo, woo, going on inside. And, and David, the man said, notice what the man said. She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah. This is interesting. When you read the Old Testament, here's how it usually is. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? And talking about Jacob, the Bible would say, this is Jacob, his father is Isaac, his great-grandfather is Abraham. You never see that where it says, the lady, this is her father, and this is who her husband is. In other words, the servant goes and says, hey, 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 David, um, before you knock on that door here, let me just re remember, this is Eliam's daughter, and this is Uriah's. In other words, in other words, David, before you do something stupid, did you forget she's, she's married? And by the way, so are you. So are you. Now, this is interesting to me. I, I've never seen that. I've preached on this passage before. Listen carefully. You're going to see a subtle compromise in his life. If you were to read 2 Samuel chapter 5, basically the first five, couple chapters, David is like, I, I said it earlier, he's like, everything is rocking. Enemies are being defeated. He's got more influence, more power, more everything. According to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13, you can make a note and read it later. The Bible says, David, listen carefully, David took more wives and concubines. You're like, ah, oh, not a big deal. A lot of people in the Old Testament had multiple wives, except that in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, the Bible says, a king of Israel should never take more concubines and wives. And David's like, no, nah, not a big deal. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyhow. 
So he violated the internal alarm and here it is, basically claps his hand, tells the servant, hey, bring her back to me. And the Bible says that when he was on the roof, she came and he saw that she was beautiful and he slept with her. So I told you about Westlake Village. I used to surf all the time in 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th grade. And we took this road. I don't know if you've ever been on it. It's called Decker Canyon. It goes from Westlake all the way to the Pacific Ocean. I've been, I, I bet you I've, been, I've driven on that road over 100 times, maybe 200. I'd go two to three times a week to surf. And de- it was really windy. And not only was it windy, there were like if, if you went up over the edge and surfed, like, ooh, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Your life is over. And it was scary. So... Uh, one year when I, I first got my motorcycle, I thought it'd be cool to go to my hometown and actually take that road because it's beautiful and it is really windy and it's actually kind of scary. But I've been on it over 100 times. So I get my motorcycle and, and there, there's just two lanes, one this direction, one in that direction. But because I was so familiar with the road, although I knew that the other side there was like a big cliff and stuff and I was going to die, because I was so familiar with the road, I got my motorcycle and I basically had like both of my tires just like hanging on. I was just like, I got this, I got this. And I was just kind of balancing between life and death. Because so I'm like, I, I've been on this road a couple hundred times. There's this thing. Why are you looking at it? Like, that's the dumbest thing in the world. I would never do that. <laughs> yeah, I got my motor. I'm just like hanging on the balance. No, I didn't do that at all. I'll tell you what, I, first, like I, I got my bike and I was like, over in the middle, like almost in the other lane, because it was scary over there, right? And I just wonder how many of us are living our life out on the edge or the ledge, living our life out on the roof, thinking, thinking it's just not a big deal. It's not, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a big deal. You might be a lot more spiritual than me. Would you look at me? I can't afford, I can't afford to compromise in any area of my life. Because here's what I know, the Bible says that the enemy is crouching at the door, And he's looking for just a little opening. And then when he gets the opening into your life, he's going to take you out. And so David compromised his life. He should have been out in battle. He was in bed. He should have never taken another wife or a concubine. He went against God's will and God's word. And I'm telling you, the second you start compromise, the enemy is going to take you out. Turn to somebody and say, get off the roof. Get off the roof. And let me remind you, the Bible says nothing good about lukewarmness, nothing good about mediocrity, nothing good about compromise, nothing good about complacency. Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth if you are lukewarm. I was telling Andy between the second and third services, I, before I got saved, I used to, I'll just be honest, I used to love to gamble. My dad got me hooked. We used to play football cards, and the first time I went to Vegas, it was like, this is awesome. If you've ever been there, don't raise your hand, but it's just like, you walk in and it's like, the energy, and it's like, I was just like, this is cool. And I went over to the blackjack table and it was fun until I lost my money, but it was fun. And there's just something about that, that energy and the excitement and the lights going and, and it's just risky and will I win and all that. And then I got saved and I hadn't been back to Vegas except about 10 years ago, I was speaking at my friend's church in Colorado and instead of driving the whole way home, I my wife and I said, let's just get a hotel in Las Vegas. And we got the Venetian hotel for like 80 bucks because it was 500 degrees. And it's like we checked into the hotel and then I just, I, I heard, ding, 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 ding. I was just like, no, there's seriously, something rose up in me like, this is awesome. And the next day I took my son, he was probably six or seven at the time, to the pool. Like every, like every girl in the pool had one of those bathing suits. And I was just like, like, Ryan, don't look. And and I, we actually had to get out of the pool and go to a different pool. I just got, I'm not saying I would never go to Las Vegas. I'm just saying for me, it's a bad place. Because there's something, I, I hear the like, ding, 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 like, oh. I just can't afford it. I can't afford it. And you, you can't afford it either, maybe in certain areas of your life. I'm not saying you can't go to Las Vegas. I'm just saying there's certain things you can't, there's certain friends you can't hang out with. There's certain people that you can't, there's certain people you can't date. You, you can't do it. There's certain friends, you cannot go back to some of those friends. You can't, you, you can't have another drink of alcohol. You can't, well, I'm just gonna, I'll just smoke a little bit of weed. You can't do that because that's gonna lead to something else. You can't compromise. You gotta close the door. The devil's gonna take you out. I'm telling you, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Compromise always leads to sin. And check this out, private sin has, here's the third point, public consequences. Write that down, David's consequences. David's consequences, verse five says, here's the knock on the door. Hey, David, I'm pregnant. There's the consequence. Now, our kid's a blessing, yes? We're going to talk about next week how David covered the whole thing up. 
And you can't cover your sin. But listen, com compromise always leads to consequences. Check it out. All the young people in here, I know you, you think you know everything. You're like 13. <laughs> I know everything. You don't know Jack. <laughs> I just got my license. I know. You don't know Jack. And you think parents are stupid. You think old people are stupid. You go, oh, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm. You don't know Jack. Because I, I thought I knew Jack. I don't know. I didn't know anything. I still don't know much. And I'm just telling you, young people, you can make a really bad decision in 2018 that's going to have consequences, not just in this year. It could be for another year or multiple years. You can't afford to be in the back of a car at 1230 at night with your boyfriend. Just, we're just like talking and making out a little bit. Yeah, but that's going to lead to something else. You can't afford to do that because you just might get pregnant at 15. And what is it like for a 15-year-old young girl to raise a kid who is a kid herself? There are consequences. And I'm just telling you, you might think you know it all. There's a lot of old people in here. In fact, if you're over the age of 30 and you made a really bad decision in your life and you are still suffering or suffered the consequences of a bad decision, would you raise your hand and encourage all the young people? I got both of my hands up, okay? Still suffering. And here's what the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, in the New Living Translation. Check this out. The Bible says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you... Hey, you put tomatoes in the ground, they're coming up. You sow a lack of integrity, a lack of respect, a lot, lack of honor, party, drugs, rock and roll. I'm telling you, that's what's coming up out of the ground. It's, it's, you, can't, God, you can't fake God out. You can't mock him. You're not going to be like, oh, I tricked him. No, you reap what you sow. You harvest what you plant. And here's the thing that young people don't know. Even adults don't know. Most of the time, we harvest in a different season than we plant. We make a bad decision on Monday. Sometimes we don't find out about it for a year from now or five years from now. But I'm telling you, that will come up out of the ground. A lack of integrity, it's coming up. Maybe not this week, but it's coming up, I promise you. Flirting with somebody at the office. My wife doesn't know. My husband doesn't know. Getting on Facebook late at night. No, no I'm telling you, it's coming up. God's going to make it evident. Be sure, Numbers 32, your sin will find you out. I don't know about you. I want my sin. I want, to be, I want to deal with it in private so it's not shouted from the housetops. Because private sin results in public consequences. And I'll tell you, I, I, I've been doing this a long time. And you don't get to read the connect cards. Pastor Steve, please pray for me and my husband. Me and my husband cheated on me. My wife cheated on me. I went away on a business trip and he brought her in or he brought in a divorce, divorce. And it's just, it runs rampant. It's ugly. It's nasty. You don't hear about the people, like, I just talked to a guy at the car show yesterday, hooked on meth for many years. It just started out with alcohol, and then it started out with weed, and then it, one thing led to another, and he goes, I, I think I'm coming out of it, but my wife is hooked, and her body is convulsing all the time. Say, you know what? They never tell, drug dealers never tell you, hey, if you do this, this is what can it lead, lead, lead to. You ever, so I went to, I went to Hong Kong years ago on our way to the Philippines. My friend said to me, have you ever eaten at Roos Chris? I said, no, I'm too cheap. He says, we're going. I said, okay. And he said, I'm buying. I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> he says, what, where, we walk into the restaurant. He said, what's your favorite food? And I said, lobster. Have you had it much? And I said, no, I'm too cheap. He says, you're getting it tonight. So they bring the menu to me. There it is. Top right corner, lobster. I'm like, oh, excuse me, ma'am. I don't see any price tag. How much is the lobster? She said something along the lines is like, You'll find out later. <laughs> so I just, I'm like, oh, he said he was buying. So I ordered it, and we, I found out later. It was $98. But I didn't give a rip because I wasn't paying. Uh, so, you'll find out later. You'll find out later. That's what the devil says. You'll find out later. He doesn't tell you up front what it's going to cost you, but you'll find out later. You lose your virginity, you're going to find out later. You, lose, you, you cheat on your husband, you're going to find out later. You start playing around with certain drugs, you're going to find out later what's going to bring to you. You're going to be in the jail or in the prison trying to sue the same state of Idaho because you're trying to blame somebody else. You know, you're going to find out. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. You're going to find out later. So I, I, I just been honestly wrecked a little bit because one of the most influential pastors in America right now, if I mentioned his name, a lot of people would know, all the stuff coming up in the news one thing's led to another, and a lady comes out, and she says, oh, yeah, 20 years ago, we were on a missions trip, and the pastor groped me in my hotel room, and another lady comes in the church. And these are people not in the church, but people on the staff, and 
respect the people. And she said, oh, yeah, kind of the same thing. He gave me a, he caressed my body and gave me a long kiss. And, and another lady came out, another lady came out. This has been going on the last couple of weeks. And all the pastors and the elders of the church, 25,000 people in this church, 11 or 12 campuses, 100 satellite churches all over the world, global, international leader. One thing leads to another. And this so all the leaders and the pastors and the elders come out and say, no, we don't believe you and you and you. Our pastor would never do that. Shut you down, shut you down, shut you down, shut you down. Further investigation has revealed this week, everybody was telling the truth. So the pastor stepped down a couple months ago. The elders and the pastors said, please forgive us. We made a mistake. We're all stepping down. Attendance has shrunk. Giving has shrunk. What's going to happen to all the satellites? I don't know. Some of the pastors that stepped down and the elder, 50 years old, what are, what are you going to do now? It's all, you, all, all you've ever done is pastor. Now you're going to go work at Walmart? I'm not knocking Walmart. I'm just saying we, to think that only your sin affects you is a lie from the pit of hell. It affects your wife, your husband, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, aunts, uncles, people all around you. I think about this all the time. What happens if I did something stupid like that? I guarantee you, just because of the influence of our church, I would, my, my face would probably be on the front page of the Star Free Press. For what? Like, for what? 20, 30 minutes? Then my kids, oh, wasn't your dad the dad that, now what would happen to our church? So the, the church that's kind of going, like, what about the people that are brand new to the Lord, and they're like, oh, man, if the pastor could do it, then forget this Jesus stuff. Like, this is serious stuff. David made a choice. His poor choice led to compromise in his life. Compromise leads to consequences. And I better finish because people look upset at me right now. So go ahead and stand your feet right now. This is a warning. This is a warning to us. God loves you. Let me say it again. This is a warning to us because God loves us. He knows that sin is painful and destructive. And so this is a warning from the Holy Spirit. Look into my eyes before I pray. Here's the, here's the justification of our sin. Well, I, I could say this. Well, I've been saved for over 30 years. I'm a pastor. I can afford to, I can't afford to do anything. I want to be careful. The Bible says in Ephesians, be careful how you live. Be, be circumspectful. I, gotta, I, gotta be, I can't afford anything. That's why I don't counsel women. If I ever meet with a woman in my office, doors always open. I will not meet a woman that's not my wife or my daughters anywhere at a hotel room, at a coffee shop. Hey, listen, I'll see people in our church. You're having lunch with somebody that you're not married to, just the two of you in a restaurant. That's a really bad decision. You need to stop that. No, you're just being legalistic. Call it what it is. I just know how the enemy is brutal. He doesn't care about you and your marriage and your kids and the consequences. He just wants you to fulfill your desires. He wants to take you down. He wants to break your family to shreds. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You got to be really careful. Be careful what you post on social media. Oh, it's just where I, did I say this in the service about the girl that came up to me, a lady, a couple years ago and said, hey, pray for me. My, my purse got stolen. I was like, what happened? She goes, well, I got to be honest with you. Last night I was at the bar with some of the girls and we were just like drinking and stuff and I got a little tipsy and then I, this guy, I saw this guy across the way and we started talking and we, we were dancing and, and then I came back to my table and my purse was gone. I got it on, on the outside, I'm like, oh, that's so bad. Yeah, I'll pray. On the inside, I'm like, you deserve it. What are you doing at the bar in the first place? I want to ask you a question. Why, why, why do some of you post on social media that you're at BJ's and you have like a beer sampler there? I, I just don't get that. Now, listen, that's between you and Jesus and the privacy. Of, if you want to have a glass of wine, that's on you. I'm not going to do that. I can't afford to do that. I used to drink too much. I'm just going to avoid it. But be, if you prayed about it and that's okay, but that's one thing. Another thing to put it on social media to see 125 of people in our church that are here on Thursday night to try to come out of recovery and then they're watching what you post and they're, they're confused. Like, hold on, I'm trying to get set free from this and then I watch, watch like not just, talk about leaders in our church. 
People serving in children's ministry, ushers, like, why, why would you do that? Avoid every appearance of evil. So you're saying that I shouldn't do something even if it looks bad, but it's not necessarily bad? Yeah. Yeah, because people are watching you. You got a whole refrigerator full of alcohol, but you're telling your 19-year-old, he can't drink. Well, he's probably good in two years. And the stuff you post on social media, your political mood, your opinion, why would you do that? People are watching you. People in our church are watching what you post. They're watching how you live above reproach. All of us make mistakes, but above reproach. Pastors cuss in the pulpit. They want to be relevant. That's stupid. People in our church cuss like F bomb, like, well, it's just a word. No, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Why are, we, why are we like the world? They sleep around, we sleep around. They drink, we drink. They divorce, we divorce. We cheat on our spouse. They, like no difference in the world. And God's coming back for a holy church. I better go because I got a lot of enemies right now. <laughs> Sorry, let me just say this. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm obligated to preach grace and truth. Grab somebody's hand here. I want to pray for us. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your truth. God, this has been a warning for all of us. Show us areas of compromise. People we shouldn't hang out with, people that we shouldn't date, movies we shouldn't go to, shows we shouldn't watch. The little things pointed out to us, God. Forgive us, we've been justifying it. Saying, oh, it's not that bad. The movie only had a couple cuss words. There was only one sex scene. It wasn't as bad as... God, we're convicted by your spirit. We confess our sin. Thank you that you're faithful and just. We love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Hey, let me say two things real quick. Number one, thank you for... I went over like 10 minutes. So thank you for... Allowing me to. Some of you didn't even know that because the clock's back there. It's okay. But the second thing I want to say, I want to, I want to make sure because the, the teachers have had your kids 15 minutes longer than usual. So just love them, thank them. And then the last thing is this. I'm going to stand right here and nobody's allowed out of the building, all the ushers, until everybody hugs seven people. All right. So get out of your seat. I'm going to watch you right now. Seven. One. I want you to count them. One. One. Come on. That's, you can't just hug your wife seven times.